to the world's largest medicine galleries, home to over 3,000 amazing objects. Spanning centuries and continents, what you'll see is both extraordinary and familiar, globally significant and deeply personal, revealing our endless quest to better understand the human body. When you enter into the galleries, you'll be greeted by Self-Conscious Jean, a sculpture by Mark Quinn, inspired by the tattooed body of model Rick Genest. And it stands at the gateway of Medicine and Bodies, which explores how the search to understand more about the human body has transformed medicine. Expanding our knowledge of the body, from learning how post-mortems are conducted, to ever closer observations, understanding the body on a microscopic scale. And revolutionary technologies such as the world's first MRI scanner that allowed us to examine the mysteries of the human body without resorting to surgery. And as you move through the gallery, you'll come face to face with a selection of historic objects collected by Henry Welcome, like this medicine chest, used by Captain Scott in the Antarctic, and marvel at some stranger things too. In this gallery, we examine the core purpose of medicine, treating people. From the ancient practice of trepanning skulls, to leech jars, blood transfusions in the trenches, and the UK's first robotic surgery. And no visit to the gallery can be complete without stepping inside this real Victorian pharmacy to learn more about poisons and how to make your own pills. In medicine and communities, we examine health challenges faced by groups of people and society, from deadly epidemics to the birth of the NHS and how our behaviour can affect our health. This is a scale model showing what a state-of-the-art hospital would have looked like in the 1930s. The model toured the country where it was viewed by thousands. It contains tiny individual tiles and the bed sheets are made of handkerchiefs that were donated by Queen Mary. In Faith, Hope and Fear, we examine the cultural side of medicine, the faith that we put in our treatment and in our doctors, and our hopes and fears about our own health. These are just a few of the objects and stories for you to enjoy in Medicine, the Welcome Galleries, here at the Science Museum in London. Good evening to everyone watching wherever you are. My name is Razia Iqbal and I am very pleased to be here chairing tonight's discussion with the Science Museum, part of a series of talks linked to the museum's medicine galleries exploring the subject of COVID-19 and in particular the topic of vaccines. Talks that have so far included the likes of Dr Anthony Fauci, Sir Patrick Valance and newly knighted dames Sarah Gilbert and Kate Bingham. We are now, of course, a year and a half into a pandemic that has changed so many aspects of so many lives around the world. But through the development of vaccines and treatments, there is light at the end of the tunnel as we continue to move towards lighter social restrictions. However, COVID-19 has not gone away. It will remain a threat for the foreseeable future and it needs to be taken seriously, perhaps now more than ever. And as vaccines are beginning to slow the rates of hospitalizations and deaths, it does seem a good time to cast an eye back to how we got to this point. Tonight, our panel discussion brings together a group of people who have been on the front line of the UK's response to coronavirus for mo more than 18 months. We will be hearing more about their experiences of both fighting the virus and working on one of the most successful vaccination programs in the world. Let's meet them all now. Firstly, please welcome the Chief Medical Officer for England and Chief Medical Advisor to the UK Government, Professor Chris Whitty. Professor Whitty has, of course, become a household name and face in the UK as a key figure at the regular Downing Street briefings, which have been 
such an important part of relaying the public health message to the country throughout the pandemic. Good evening, Professor Whitty, and welcome. Next, we have Dr. Kevin Fong, broadcaster, author, and anaesthetist, who since March 2020 has been working in NHS England's Emergency Preparedness, Resilience, and Response Team for COVID-19. We're also joined by Dr. Margaret McCartney, a practicing GP, writer, and broadcaster, who writes regularly for the British Medical Journal and The Guardian, and is the author of three books. Now, during COVID-19, Dr. McCartney was a regular guest on BBC Radio 4's Inside Health, and she is also a patron of Health Watch UK. That's a charity which challenges poor evidence in health reporting. Finally, we are delighted to be joined also by Professor Kevin Fenton, Public Health Regional Director for London. Professor Fenton was previously the director of the National Centre for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention, the US Center for Disease Control. Good evening to you, Professor Fenton. A very warm welcome to you all, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start by having a brief conversation with each of you individually, and then we'll open it up to a broader panel discussion. And we'll also take some of the questions that have been sent in by our audience in advance. Professor Whitty, I'd like to begin with you, if I may. Let's go back to those first three months in 2020. By New Year's Day in 2020, there were already dozens of cases of pneumonia of an unknown cause that were being treated in Wuhan in Hubei province in China. Three weeks later, other countries, Japan, South Korea, and the United States had confirmed cases. Let's just take you right back. At what point did you sense that this was going to be something that we needed to take notice of here in the UK? Thank you. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that every year there are um, outbreaks and epidemics in multiple places around the world. And the question is always which ones are going to grow and which ones are not. And when we had the initial reports, uh, very end of December 2019, and then the first few days of January, there were broadly three possibilities that this would be a local uh, outbreak that would just die out, as many do, that this would become a large outbreak locally with some spillover to other countries, or that this would expand into a kind of pandemic on the scale it is at the moment. And of course, the last of those was at that point the least likely, actually, uh, because, as I say, there are multiple epidemics. As the months went by, it became clear this was not just going to be a local outbreak in China, it was clearly spilling out more widely, as you say, by the end of the month. Uh, and it became increasingly clear as we went through uh, January, February, and uh, obviously then uh, early March, that this was now gonna turn into a global problem and a global problem uh, of substantial proportions. But it, that, that became clear by degrees, but we were planning for all three scenarios from the beginning. So planning for the for all three scenarios from the beginning, I mean, I, I, I wonder at what point did you think actually, this isn't just an epidemic, this is a pandemic. I mean, obviously, there are technical reasons for why the WHO will name something a pandemic. But but did you feel in February, say, when we were seeing really large numbers of cases in Italy and, and hospitals in Italy really not being able to cope? From, well, from the time that we started to see substantial spread in more than one country outside China, it was clear this was going to cause become a global problem. Uh, it wasn't yet completely clear what the scale of it was, but that was clear from that point onwards. Uh, and it had really got beyond the point of uh, related coronaviruses like SARS and MERS, which had previously occurred, which really had a central country and then a few uh, countries where there was a slightly more substantial uh, spread for much lower and then spillover cases. This had now clearly become a global problem. Uh, really quite early on in February. And and when, you know, you alluded to um, MERS and, and SARS, I mean, I, I just wonder at what point did you think this is much, much more serious than those, which of course were focused in the Middle East, in the in the case of MERS and SARS in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia specifically? Well, I think the point where it became clear was when you had several countries with very substantial outbreaks. That's the that's where they really deviated away from where SARS was. Uh, MERS had, apart from uh, Saudi Arabia, where it is largely based, one uh, major outbreak, which was in South Korea, 
uh, SARS uh, had a wider um, uh, series of outbreaks, uh, including in Canada uh, and some spillover elsewhere. But once it's gone to several countries, it clearly was going to spread everywhere. Uh, and the, the question was, was simply a matter of how fast and what the mortality rates were and things like this. One important difference was that this disease was clearly much less trans, uh, less, um, less dangerous for, the, for an individual who caught it than SARS or, or MERS. So MERS, are roughly 35% of people who catch it die. SARS, it's closer to about 10% of people who die. This one, from fairly early on, due to Chinese research, we knew that it was probably closer to about 1% but it was clearly much more transmissible. And that really was the problem with it. And, and the transmissibility was something that became apparent very quickly to you. Were you looking at this and thinking, this is something we really need to be looking at? Yeah, so the first question was, has everyone who got this caught it from another source? Is there, for example, an animal outbreak that's just spilling over to humans? Once it became clear there was human to human spread, it was then how fast is it moving? And it was very clearly moving quite fast in China. And then once it had got beyond China's borders, it was clear which way things were going. I, I, I wonder about, uh, because this is connected to what you've said so far, that this idea of information, the, the fact that you are engaged in daily government briefings, the public health campaigns that have taken pace, place, they've just become part of what we are now used to since, since March of 2020. In, in, the, in this particular case, how important or how would you characterise the importance of, of timely information on, on case rates, on testing, on, on advice to do with safety? And how much has that mattered in terms of public health, but also crucially trust? Well, I mean, I think it's uh, you know, everybody says, and they're right, that you have to give as much information as you have uh, pretty well as soon as you've got it. And there's no advantage to not giving information. The problem, of course, we had early on in the pandemic is our own understanding, and this is true across the world, was very limited. So we were having to uh, say, well, these are the things we know, but there's a lot of things we don't know. As time's gone by, we've been able to give an increasingly large amount of information that we're confident of. But right near the beginning, we didn't even have accurate diagnosis. So there was a lot of people we weren't sure whether they had the disease or not, for example. So it's how do you communicate uncertainty in an honest way? Uh, and how do you communicate relatively technical information in a way that's accessible to everybody? And that really is the key to this. And I'm very grateful to a very large number of scientists and broadcasters who really helped to do that. It wasn't just a few people. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure. It, I mean, it was. It was many, many, many people who were engaged in, in that. But but when you look back now, and, and, and perhaps it's in many ways too early to look back, because as we said right at the beginning, we're still in it. We still need to continue to take it very seriously. But when doctors in Italy were warning, for example, really, you should be looking at this. How much were you nervous that we weren't prepared enough, perhaps, in February? Well, I mean, I think what we all knew was that there was an extremely wide range of possible outcomes and that we didn't have, at that point, the diagnostic capacity to be able to track this. So we knew we were, to some extent, flying blind, and that was clear at the time and it's been clear since. Um, so inevitably, uh, we were very concerned that the, you know, the top of the range outcomes were even worse than the very bad epidemic we've had in the UK. And there was that range uh, existed from the beginning and was clear from the beginning. We tried to communicate that from the beginning. So we were clearly extremely concerned. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you say, we are not by any means out of this, the woods yet on this, in much better shape due to the vaccine programme uh, and drugs and a variety of other things. But this has got a long way to run in the UK and it's got even further to run globally. And I think we really shouldn't believe that this is somehow just about to finish. That is that is far from where we are at the moment. Is there anything you think that you would do differently, given the chance in terms of messaging in those early weeks and months? Well, I mean, I think there's inevitably um, there's things which were just to do with I didn't express things very well. There were many things which, in retrospect, the information we gave in good faith at the time was 
what we thought was correct and then we changed where the scientific view was. Masks was an example of that. Uh, the important, the relative importance of asymptomatic transmission was another important example of that. So there are things which, you know, if you could, with many of these things, if you could run it again, knowing what you know six months later, of course, you do it a lot better. Uh, I think that with all of these things, the thing which will really you have to try and do, though, is be honest about uncertainty and try as best you can to be consistent. So that you're giving the same message to everybody if privately and publicly. Uh, and you know, we didn't get, always get that right. That doesn't mean we didn't try. How confident are you that we will get to the point of being able to avoid non-pharmaceutical interventions altogether to tackle the virus? I mean, do, do you think that vaccinations and other treatments um, that are in development will, will get us closer to that point anytime soon? Um, I've been very confident right from the beginning that science would find us a way out. What wasn't clear early on was which area of science. So the last pandemic on this scale, for example, HIV, we look for a vaccine, we still don't have one, but we do have excellent drugs and behavior has changed and that, that has led to a complete change of the disease. Uh, with this one, um, yes, over, we, we are, we're substantially much lower risk now due to vaccination and some drugs. I'm confident in uh, a year's time, we'll have better vaccines and more drugs that will help take the risk even further down. Uh, and at a certain point, we'll be able to say virtually anything it can do to us, uh, we're likely to be able to respond to quite quickly. But in the medium term, we could get a vaccine uh, escape uh, variant that actually gets around our principal line of defence, which is vaccination, at least to some degree, and takes us some of the way backwards. The further out in time we go, the more tools we have at our disposal from science, the less likely that is. But you can never take that possibility completely off the table. But, you know, science has done a phenomenal job so far and it will continue to do so. I mean, you, you've been at the forefront of having to navigate uh, the relationship between science and politics. And, and that's a very, very tricky uh, road to navigate. And as we are on the cusp of uh, the almost lifting all the restrictions that we've been living under here in the UK, I mean, I, I, I wonder what your reflections are when you hear from someone like Mike Ryan at WHO, who, who's warning countries, not just this one, many countries, of, of lifting restrictions too quickly so that, so, so that we don't lose the gains that we've made, which are considerable. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that, uh, you know, I've said really as clearly as I can over the, for the next stage is the questions about regulations are essentially binary. People's behavior is not binary. And what we really need to do, all of us, is take things incredibly slowly. I would, I would reiterate that now, that what we, you know, every stage we take has got to be taken very slowly. And this next stage in particular, we have to at some point get to a point where there aren't regulations that are specific to COVID. We need to get to that point as slowly as we can. And that's, what, that's around people's behaviours. And let, you know, if you look over what people have done, and in fact, if you look at what people intend to do now, People have been incredibly good at saying, I may be at relatively low risk, but people around me are at high risk, and I'm going to modify my behaviours, I'm going to reduce my contacts, I'm going to wear masks in crowded environments, I'm going to open the windows and improve ventilation, meet outside, the things we know we know work. Uh, and they've done that, and they intend to continue to do that. And that's the key to this, you've just got to go slowly. Professor Chris Whitty, thank you very much. Uh, don't go away. We'll be speaking uh, much more during the panel discussion, but we're going to hear from our next speaker now, Dr. Kevin Fong, who since the start of the pandemic has been working in NHS England's emergency preparedness, resilience and response team. A very good evening to you, uh, Kevin. Tell us, first of all, about the role that you were seconded to back in March 2020. Yeah, I mean, it feels like about a million years ago now. Um, so uh, I, I was pulled in, I think, you know, there was a lot happening back then. I was pulled in partly because I had some experience of, of major incidents in the past and, and particularly at looking at surge and the character, the mathematical character of surge, a bit of mathematical modeling. Um, and really I had a very broad remit then. I think we talked about information there uh, with Chris um, and this was all about information. So my job very broadly was to get the best information I could across the full spectrum of, of organizations that were involved, to pull that together, to pass it up 
so that people might make the best decisions that could be made. And so, uh, you know, I was with NHS England and the severe COVID response team. I'd sit on those meetings. I would be with the joint uh, modeling team at, at Public Health England. I supported Joint Biosecurity Center. But in addition to that, I was going out and seeing the teams on the ground. I think that was very important for me. Uh, the, the, the data that we had that we joined it up with the picture on the ground because sometimes that was missing. So it's been a pretty roving remit, but, but for me, it's been about information, about going across all the different silos, making sure that I could pull that together and then provide you know what I felt was the right information in the hope that it could be used well. So, I mean, witnessing the first, the second, and now arguably the, the third wave of uh, this pandemic from the front line, I mean, we know that those times were enormous precious points for the NHS, but how different were those periods and how did they present different challenges? So was, in an abstract sense, it was uh, interesting really to watch what happened to us, uh, um, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at other organizations for how they respond in moments of crisis and seeing what lessons we might bring back to us in the NHS. And then I'm watching my own organization uh, uh, involved in the biggest crisis really in, in you know, living memory for anyone. Um, and there's something quite celebratory really about the way the teams responded in that first wave. The, the 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 time from when we became aware this was going to become a problem to it actually washing up into our units and us seeing large number of large numbers of patients was very very short and what you saw was our teams take that challenge head on uh pivot and turn into uh, a, a new uh, really turn the whole service over to this challenge on block in a way that I have never ever seen and it really was impressive and inspiring and I've never really been proud of the people that I work with. The first wave there was disbelief um, but if you ever want to see you know the how to do it guide of how to meet challenge that was it and I you know that was my my colleagues my friends in the units. After that there was this sense of well you know hopefully it can't happen again but as we came into the autumn uh for a second wave and then really a third wave you know i would argue we've already had there, there was one in the autumn that was mostly experienced by the northeast and the northwest and then and then uh, uh the third really experienced uh, by the whole country in january and february um we had some advantages we knew what we were doing we had processes but it was much harder logistically there was there was a, there was a much greater challenge um and the teams people say and the teams were tired they were more than tired they were injured uh, injured psychologically we have good evidence of that uh, and so uh, the second wave was easier in some ways because we knew what we were doing we were better supplied it was harder because we'd been through it already and there wasn't much gas left in the tank. Yeah, I, we certainly can remember many of the stories of how um, how hard it was for uh, frontline healthcare workers. I mean, when we've all had to become science literate, or at least data literate, pretty quickly uh, during the course of this pandemic, the, the relationship between the data and the human face of that is is what you have uh, witnessed. I, I mean, I, I wonder how, if you'll just reflect for us what that was like for you to, to, to just be always there with the data in your mind, but also seeing the how it manifests itself uh, in, in the impact on, on human beings. So I, I think, I hope this is one of the places that I brought some value. Um, I think I understood early on that this was this is an extraordinary complex instance and we've been lucky to have a lot of data very quickly but the data is always going to be a reduction it's always going to be some reduction of the truth and the true picture and really the way this played out had to be seen and in fact one weekend i was on the phone to a colleague in one of the units and i was trying to ask him how how things were and uh, he said listen i i could try and describe it to you but but um but you're much better to come and i went 
and I walked into that unit and, and, you know, it really was indescribable. It was indescribable. And, and I met the team at the door. I said, how is it? I'll never forget. Uh, the, the consultant there said, it's, it's like a terrorist attack, uh, every day. And you don't know when the attacks are going to stop. And that wasn't a hyperbolic statement at all. And, and if you look at the numbers of critically ill people we've had to look after every single day in every single hospital that's been involved, which is pretty much every single hospital, that is an absolutely true statement. So for me, it was a bizarre, but I hope a useful experience to on, on in the morning, I'd get up, I'd sit on the calls in the morning, uh, I'd listen to the reports come through from all over the country. I would spend very often my afternoons going into the units and seeing what those numbers really meant. And I think that it's important that we are able to communicate that because the numbers are one thing, but there are people on the end of it. There are people on the end of it who are suffering with the disease. There are people on the end of it who are struggling with everything they have to deal with and treat this pandemic, treat the people caught up in this pandemic. And so my job in the end, I think, has been to close the gap between the statistics and what the reality of what's happening on the ground. Well, let's stay with that um, that relationship uh, a little bit. And th there, there will be lots and lots of people who know people who've been sick. They got sick themselves. They'll know people who have died from this virus. But there will be lots of people who are very fortunate to not know anyone who has become seriously unwell. For those people in particular, it could arguably be quite easy to forget or put to one side how serious this virus is, what would you say to them? Look, I mean, I, I can totally understand how if you have not been, you are fortunate enough to not have been touched directly by the illness itself and the virus, how it's difficult to conceptualise just what has happened to the people who have been touched by the infection itself, who have suffered serious illness, who have lost people to this. Um, but, but really, you know, I, I cannot overstate what this thing has been like. I have been a doctor for 22 years. I have seen five major incidents in London, I, London. I've seen some of the worst major incidents that we have seen in this country and nothing, but nothing has been like this pandemic has been every single day. And, and you have to take me on trust on that. You know, that's what I do. This is my job. And it is, I think... I can understand why people have trouble conceptualizing that, but I think it is disrespectful to the teams who have given everything uh, to meet this, to, to deny it flat out. You, know, you have to listen to my account and either you believe me or you don't, but I've been there and my colleagues have been there. Um, and, and this has been a struggle every day and the struggle continues. And we are grateful for the help the public have given us in this. The, 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 you know, this is not something that we can beat alone. Uh, we need the science, we need the medicine, we need the innovation, but in the end, we need the public as well. And the public have been the mainstay of our defense here. So we're grateful for that. And, you know, yes, it is frustrating. It is frankly infuriating for the people who willfully deny this experience. Dr. Kevin Fong, thank you very much indeed. Um, joining us from Glasgow is a GP writer, broadcaster and advocate for evidence-based medicine, Dr. Margaret McCartney. A very warm welcome to you. You're a practicing GP. Just outline for us how your day-to-day -day work has been impacted by what we've all been seeing over the last 18 months or so. Well, it's been an um, it's been an absolute sea change. You know, we've, we've um, you know general practice in the UK was in crisis before COVID nineteen came along. There was no question about that. You know, people were um, working well beyond safe limits. I think um, most GPs would agree with that. I think, and I'm I'm an, I'm an ordinary GP. I work in a local surgery, and um, you know. Day-to-day -day work before the pandemic was tough. It was very difficult. There was lots of GP vacancies, lots of practices struggle to get through the work that we want to every day because there is so much of it and often too few people to do the job. So when COVID-19 came along, this was a stress service that was that, that was our primary care bedrock of the NHS. 
And um, I, I cannot tell you how amazing um, general practice has been, how fantastic my colleagues have been. There have been GPs all over the country who have stepped up enormously, providing new COVID services, running COVID hubs, specific COVID um, triage telephone lines, uh, but not just general practitioners, our nursing staff, unbelievably incredible, just, uh, you know, just adapted, have moved mountains really to try and do a great job. Our reception staff, unbelievably amazing who've come into work all the way through you know like like everyone else has done there's there's a massive team in primary care and you know the cleaning staff for example you know everyone coming into work and um, feeling perhaps quite frightened especially at the start of the pandemic people not being vaccinated and um, patients of course still needing to be seen face to face as we have done all the way through um, as appropriate um, so I, I am, I suppose, just still amazed at how fantastic primary care is. And of course, I am biased because I'm a GP. But I think the pandemic has also brought out the very best in people. And, and like I say, there has been a huge amount of staff have been just incredible, have, have moved mountains. Yeah. And let, let's let's just unpack a little of what of what you've said. I mean, obviously, huge huge commitment in terms of primary health care. But what about the health messaging? Uh, first of all, how how much had GP surgeries thought? Well, actually, we're the first port of call. If you're not being taken into uh, emergency departments in hospitals, many people will be turning to, to to GPs. In terms of messaging, how how did you feel that had been handled yes yeah, so in general practice we're really lucky because um one of the real joys of general practice is, is knowing our patients and we have a great privilege in often having long-term relationships with our patients knowing them quite well knowing their families knowing their next door neighbors and really being part of the community so i, I live and work in the same patch and it is um it's, it's fantastic really and um, so when the first stages of the pandemic were underway. People were often extremely frightened. And of course, the letters started to go out for shielding, for shielding patients. And my nursing staff were incredible. They really aimed to phone everyone that was put on the shielding list to have a conversation with them. How were they? What did we know about the pandemic? What were your fears? Obviously, we all have um, similar fears. And some people had extra fears as well about people they're living with or caring for. And because you've got those relationships with people already, it really puts you at an advantage because you've already got a relationship, hopefully, of some trust as well so I think um, we, we did do lots of um, we did we did do lots of communication as much as we possibly could with people and when we started off getting um, COVID, back, um, COVID testing results back and once the, the testing program started out and symptomatic people were being tested um, our, our nursing staff were incredible we were not just phoning all the patients who came back as being positive to find out how they were um, and if we could do anything else for them but we also phoned people back that were negative um, to, to, to tell them about the false negative rate of the test and um, if people were um, clinically showing signs of COVID infection despite having a negative test we were giving clinically based advice on how to manage that so we, we did do our, our very best but as time has gone on more people getting tested it became very difficult to hold that because of course um, lots of patients need attention not just from a COVID point of view but from all the other illnesses that are happening already you know and particularly mental illness is, is something that um, I've been very aware of through the pandemic as well. Well, just just tell us a little bit about that then, the, the connected directly to how people were coping with the pandemic. So most people have been amazing and have, you know, most individuals have worked so hard to keep themselves mentally well, who've done, you know, lots of things to try and help. But when you've got people who are already vulnerable, socially vulnerable, perhaps don't have people to get medications for them, have been just about managing before, it often doesn't take very much to um, really put people in an, an extremely vulnerable situation. And, and the, uh, the same thing keeps happening again and again in medicine. The people who are very most in need very rarely put themselves forward to get the help that they should be getting. Uh, and this is the inverse care law. And um, we see it time and time again, when you've act got to actively go and find the people that you know are, are most likely to be needing help and yet probably aren't and coming forward themselves for, for all kinds of reasons so, so there is this kind of paradoxical problem within general practice and when you've got strong primary care with um with active ongoing relationships with people over a long period of time these are the kinds of things you're really trying your best to identify and to try and minimize the adverse effects of but it's really hard yeah, I, I can imagine. We we know that there is a, a, a fair bit of vaccine hesitancy still out there here in the UK and in many, many other parts of the world also. As a GP, how much have you had the chance to engage with those people who are 
hesitant, but also in some cases actively hostile to the, the idea of, of having a vaccine? And, and how have you handled that? What do you say to them? Yeah, I mean, most people um, have been desperate to have their vaccination and absolutely delighted to get it. So the vast majority of people are, are thrilled, you know, and, and certainly I was very moved by the queues of people, very patiently waiting um, for their vaccination, particularly young people. My, my two adult children were absolutely thrilled to get their appointments and immediately um, Instagramming it or whatever it is that young people do these days. So so I think for the vast majority of people, they've been really delighted to get it and really, um, I'm really happy to do so. And, and there's certainly some people who are, have got legitimate concerns who are worried that it's been washed through or they're worried it hasn't been adequately tested and and I've been really happy to tell people that I was part of um, the Novavax trial I did it purely out of self-interest because I wanted to get my vaccine really quickly and I was very happy to take the risk of it being a placebo so um so I've been um, very happy to tell people that and um I was very proud of the slightly red arm that I had afterwards as well because I thought probably I had the, the active vaccination at that point so I was um I, I was um really um, proud and, and pleased to be part of that trial, really delighted to be offered. But if people have got legitimate questions, I think that we should never make people feel silly or stupid for asking questions. I think it's really important that people who have got legitimate concerns can have a, a conversation with someone that they trust about their fears and concerns. And I think that that's what parents very often do with their children in MMR. They just want to have a, a kind of face to face discussion or a reassuring phone call to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And of course they are. But, but it's been a frightening time for many people. You haven't been seeing your mum or your gran or your big sister who would normally chat through these things with you. You haven't been having a chat with your colleagues who've had their vaccinations and have been fine. Everything's been a bit weird. So I think we should treat people with questions with absolute respect and dignity and have a good conversation and hopefully hopefully um, it will help people to make a decision that they feel confident and comfortable to have the vaccination. And there are a few people who I think will not be persuaded by the evidence and who um, are, for whatever reason, philosophical philosophically again to that in my mind we have to make it really easy for people to change their minds and not shame people or humiliate them or make them feel silly or stupid or, or you know it's really important that people's views are held are heard but equally you know we have to be critical about the information that people are perhaps acting on but at the same time we must make it really easy for people to change their minds and when they wish to do so if they wish to do so. It's a wonderful way to, to frame it, and I'm sure you have persuaded people. Margaret, thank you very much indeed. We, we are going to be opening the discussion up to the whole panel in just a moment, uh, but let's uh, speak to our fourth, fourth and final speaker, Public Health Regional Director uh, for London, Professor Kevin Fenton. Uh, welcome uh, this evening. Uh, you, uh, Professor thank Fenton, you. were the lead author uh, last summer of an influential Public Health England report on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on minority ethnic communities and highlighted some of those health disparities that we have become more familiar with now. So a three-part question, summarise the findings of the report first, if you wouldn't mind. Also, how findings have informed the response to COVID and, and also whether there's been an improvement in the last 12 months, given what we now know. Well, thank you, Razia, and good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and so so wonderful to hear the stories and the recollections and the perspectives of uh, my co-panelists. So last year, uh, in April of last year, we were commissioned by the Chief Medical Officer, as well as the Secretary of State at that time in Public Health England, to undertake a systematic look at what was happening during the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic and its disproportionate impact on risks and outcomes. And so Public Health England undertook two studies, uh, two pieces of work. The first was an epidemiological report, which looked at the clinical data to explore the likelihood of being diagnosed with COVID, the likelihood of developing severe disease and being admitted to hospital, as well as the likelihood of dying from the disease during the first wave of the pandemic. Now, in addition to the epidemiological data, we also undertook a structured and systematic community and stakeholder engagement exercise, undertaking focus group discussions with more than 4,000 individuals over a six week period. People working at national, regional, local levels, people working at the frontline, healthcare workers, social care workers, people in the faith communities, politicians, to really understand the lived experiences of having gone through the pandemic, 
to understand why communities and certain subgroups of our communities were at high risk of developing adverse outcomes. And most importantly, to understand what we could do together to help to reduce the risk of these disparities occurring in the future. So both reports were published in June of last year. So we are now almost a year past the publication of those reports. And at that time, those reports were the first from the Department of Health that really had this systematic look at inequalities. And you're absolutely right. The key findings were from the epidemiological survey that COVID was not a great leveler and it didn't randomly affect everybody in the population equally. But in fact, we saw significant differences by age. So the older you were, the more likely you were to have severe disease and to die from the infection. We had an observed differential impacts by sex. So men had a higher likelihood of developing severe disease and dying from infection. People who lived in more deprived parts of the country had higher rates of severe disease and death. And so too did some Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And in the first wave of the pandemic, that risk of severe disease and death was particularly marked in South Asian and Black African and Black Caribbean communities. So the epidemiological data pointed to this disparities, and that was precisely why the stakeholder engagement exercise, learning about the context, getting those stories and the narratives, the learned lived experiences from people were so important. And there we learned, Razia, about the importance of the long-standing disparities that many of our communities face and how COVID actually layered on top and made those disparities worse. We learned about the impact of housing and overcrowded housing. We learned about the importance of the kinds of jobs that people do and how that places them at risk. And most importantly, we heard and learned about trust and how lack of trust in government, lack of trust in the NHS could really prevent people from accessing services early and would prevent people from taking up some of the life-saving treatment. So much was learned in that, those two reports at the beginning of the year. Well, let's, let's look at the issue of trust. As, as London's Regional Director for Public Health England, I mean, I wonder how surprised you are in the context of everything that you've said in those reports that, that London has a, a lower vaccine uptake than the rest of the country. Well, not too surprised, because in fact, before the pandemic, we know that London, because of its very large size, its density, the diversity of the population, the marked differences in social and economic status across our city, we've always had lower rates of vaccine uptake for all types of vaccines, for childhood vaccinations and adult vaccinations compared to other regions in the country. And indeed, if you look at our screening rates for breast cancer screening or cervical cancer screening, we also saw lower uptake and some of the same patterns that we're observing in terms of hesitancy and low uptake for the coronavirus vaccine, we had identified those differences in the past. So we were gearing up for these differences and that's why much of our work on addressing hesitancy and engaging with communities began way before the first vaccine was given because we learned from wave one of the pandemic that we needed to have deeper engagement with our communities to learn about issues of trust in order to, when the vaccine was available, ensure that we're delivering it in ways that were most meaningful and acceptable to our local communities. You know, my, I, I'm South Asian and my mother didn't want to have the vaccine and she was persuaded. I was so interested to hear Margaret talking about uh, listening to people and making sure that they are heard because she, I think, was partly persuaded by her GP in, in the end. Um, and and I, I was very surprised that she, she was so hesitant. I mean, I, I was shocked because she's 82 and I obviously wanted her to have it. And I, I wonder when, you know, there are there is so much, not just anecdotal evidence, but there's significant evidence that vaccination uptake is, is lower in, in minority ethnic people. And I, is this an issue of trust? Is it connected to the relationship between those communities and, and power? And not, you know, that is, is that part of it as well? 
It certainly is part of it, but it would be disingenuous of me to say, sit here and say that that's the only reason. What we've learned over the last eight months since the vaccine has been uh, available is that there are a range of factors. So trust in government, trust in the vaccine, real concerns about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. And as we've been doing engagement sessions, people have asked whether the early scientific studies on the effectiveness of the vaccine were done in people who looked like you and I. So, you know, real concerns about safety, the pace of development of the vaccine. But we also know there are practical issues which affect communities as well. So we know that some vaccine delivery channels work better for some communities and some demographics than others. So for example, if you have a mass vaccination event in a football stadium, you're likely to get a younger, more mobile demographic uh, as compared to if you have an outreach vaccination clinic in a local community, working with your community pharmacies and knocking on doors. So the channels that you have available and access to the vaccine is important. And then finally, ensuring that you're having real, honest conversations with communities. You know, many communities were saying, you've never engaged us before. You've never listened to some of the concerns that we've had. Why are you coming now and what's in it for us? And we had to take the time to build those relationships, develop materials in different languages, using images that were relevant and appropriate and acceptable to communities in order to ensure we're getting those messages out. And if I go back to one of the lessons that we learned from that first report, uh, Razia, it was the importance of meeting communities where they are at and recognizing that the exit from this pandemic will not come from a single national agency but it's by the actions that everybody takes every day consistently to help to reduce transmission of this infection. And that's where the win's going to be. Is it your view, just very briefly, that, that those the lessons that you are saying have been learned are now effective, that you are being able to persuade mm -hmm. people, even though we're seeing the data suggests that, that, that those communities are really still very low in terms of uptake? Well, as the pandemic has evolved and we've gone through waves one and waves two and now we're in waves three, we're seeing how the virus itself is differentially impacting different communities. And when we wrote the report a year ago, we only had seven key recommendations in that report because we were convinced that for the system to move quickly and to have the impact that it needed to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic on communities, we had to focus on a few things, do them well and at scale. So over the past year, we've seen a real difference in the quality of research which has been done on this issue to understand these differences and, more importantly, to address them. We've seen real changes in how we're communicating with communities. And you look at the Department of Health uh, campaigns now and you see the rich diversity of our communities in different languages and, and me mechanisms. We're giving messages out using different channels whether it is community champions, whether it is community radio, in addition to the Daily Telegraph and the Times. And so we're reaching communities using mechanisms and methods which work for them. And most importantly, our organizations are really focused on addressing inequalities in ways that I haven't seen in, in nearly 30 years of practice as a physician. Leadership from the top of organizations that understand inequalities and understand the importance of addressing them, both for the pandemic and as we emerge uh, from this phase of the pandemic as well. Kevin Fenton, thank you. Thank you all uh, for those individual contributions. Uh, let's open up the discussion now. We've heard so much already about uh, sections of society uh, that don't appreciate the seriousness uh, of the virus. Let's consider the alternative or an alternative reality. If we hadn't used the tools that were at our disposal, policymakers, politicians, etc., lockdown, social distancing, mask wearing, all of these things being mandatory. If we hadn't done that, if we carried on as normal, what would the pandemic have looked like here in the UK? A, a question first for you, uh, Professor Whitty. Well, I think, uh, I mean, two obvious starting points I and mean, the first of which is things are pretty have been pretty bad without you know even with all the things that we've had at our disposal so you know over 120,000 of our fellow citizens have died with us doing a huge amount socially huge amount in the NHS and a huge amount in science 
Uh, if we had not done those things, things would have been substantially worse. There's no, no two ways about that. Uh, and the first wave, in fact, could have been uh, in, in, just on its own, substantially larger numbers than we've had in this pandemic to date. So the numbers were, were potentially extraordinarily high. And the reason for that is that although um, the mortality rate, if you get this, if 100 people get this, only probably roughly one was dying right at the beginning of the pandemic. It's less now due to better medical treatment. Uh, and will be less, even more, le even even lower over the future because of vaccination. But if you multiply that by millions of people, you actually end up with a very big impact. And this is really the effect that this pandemic has had. So it would have been very large numbers. But the second thing to uh, to just to, to stress is that although people who think this is not a big problem make a lot of noise and get on quite a lot of news channels. Actually, they are a very, very small minority of the population. And just to go back and just two acid tests of this, the first of which is the vaccination program. As Margaret was saying, completely agree, and, uh, uh, and uh, Kevin as well, if people don't believe there's a problem, they won't get vaccinated. If you look in the groups which are now almost entirely uh, through the vaccination program, the vaccination rates are in the high 90s. These are people who see the problem and they wish to protect themselves and their families and the wider community by being vaccinated. And when you look at the polling on the lockdowns, uh, over, again, very, very high proportion of the population, well over 70% of the population, supportive or strongly supportive of these really very strong social measures that were impacting on them and their lives, their social lives, their economic lives, their families, their children. And they did that because they could see this as a very serious problem. So I think it, I think we shouldn't be, in a sense, mesmerised by the relatively small proportion of people who say, no, there isn't a problem. They are noisy, but they're a very, very small proportion of the population. And I think we should never really lose touch with them. Uh, Dr. Kevin Fong, would you like to uh, just uh, inhabit that alternative reality for a moment? Well, I mean, it's very difficult, actually, to even begin to try and imagine it. Uh, look, I, I remember sitting there with the teams in my hospital looking at the numbers and what the projections were, and we found ourselves seeing the projections and us running out of resources within days. I mean, within days. And so even as it was, the challenge that we faced, even with all the measures in place, objectively looked almost insurmountable, and yet we did. And, and we as a health service from you know every point of it, public health, primary care, secondary care, all the way through, stretched ourselves into the gap between the demand that was gonna be created by COVID and the, the supply that we had available. And that came at massive cost to us. Uh, and we were even, as Chris says, even with the measures that we put in place, we were stretched to breaking point and in many cases beyond. So so it is, I think, unimaginable really to think what it would have been like had we done nothing. That it would you would you would it wouldn't have been possible because at some point you would have realized you had to intervene. And so uh I just we did what was what we needed to do. And without it, I think, uh, you know, you, you can't begin to imagine what would have happened to, to, to us as a, as a population without, without measures. Well, let's, let's talk about what learning to live with the virus uh, looks like. Uh, Kevin Fenton, when, when we look to the future, what, what does it mean? Does it mean that we have to accept a certain level of risk of both death and illness? just as being part of normal life? Do we see this as, um, you know, an acceptable number of people who will be sick and we just have to, in the way that many people die in the winter from flu and get very ill with flu, is that what that looks like? Or, or, or do we have to also take into account that there may well be periodic lockdowns if there are variants that emerge that don't um, that, that are able to intervene in, in, the, in the vaccine that we had? Uh, you know, it, it could, the answer may well be all of the above, Razia, and, and the reality is that we're at such a, an important point in our response to this pandemic as we approach July 19th and as we prepare for the removal of restrictions. And as uh, Chris Whitty has said, it really is important that we approach this new phase as cautiously as we can, 
uh, that we begin that process of re-entry and mixing in society as cautiously as we can in order to manage transmission of the infection and to help to limit the spread of infection in community. And I think this principle is going to be with us as we go through the summer and then again back into the autumn and winter where we can expect to have both uh, subsequent increases with more people returning to schools and universities, people returning from uh, overseas holidays, et cetera. So living with the virus to me is not removing uh, and denying the existence of the virus and acting as if it isn't there, but it is building upon the lessons that we've had for the last 18 months, understanding the importance of hands, face, space, ventilate, understanding the importance of vaccination, participating in the boost program, if and when it is recommended in the autumn, ensuring that we really pay attention to testing, diagnosing and isolating at home if we're infected. All the tools and the interventions that we've learned over the past 18 months, it's about integrating them into everyday life and learning to live with the virus while actively managing its transmission in society. And I think that's to me what, what this phase is about. And then finally, as, as others have said, science has delivered the vaccine, communities are delivering trust and engagement and local authorities and the NHS are working to keep communities safe. That partnership has been key over the past 18 months. So living with COVID, means as we reopen and we re-enter into society, how do we support these structures, these pillars of the response to help us to navigate this new phase? Dr. Margaret McCartney, I mean, you've argued for better evidence, better research on, on non-drug interventions during the entire pandemic. So the things that we're talking about, learning to live with this virus, the mask wearing, the social distancing, do you think that the, the shortage of data, there's certainly been data, but the shortage of data regarding these things has had an effect on, on the messaging. Yeah, so public health messaging is, is really difficult, I think, to, to get right from my point of view, because so much of medicine is uncertain. But public health messaging has to be short and simple and um, readily understood, which means that a lot of the subtleties perhaps don't always get transferred across. And people are, ask, are acting with very good intentions. There's no bad actors here. And um, this is a pandemic. Um, people were, you know, in, organizationally, everything was very stressed and stretched. And I don't blame anyone for the kinds of things that have happened so I'm not I'm not going to um, start saying that this was wrong and that was wrong but but what really concerns me is that we're using a huge amount of non-drug interventions on millions of people and quite often we're assuming that they work you know we're assuming that they are doing as good and I'm worried that a lot of them might not be doing as very much good at all and we wouldn't need to do them and I'm also worried that some non-drug interventions might actually be creating a bit of a false sense of security and we rely on them or trust them to do more than we think, that, more than the evidence we eventually hopefully get it. So for example, we'd say that we for could example give me an example well, of that. Well, say every second swing in children's parks tied off because of COVID. So was that really necessary? Or even children's playgrounds as a whole being tied off? Was that actually going to be safer compared with letting small children run around where they were? Perspex shields at, at, um, at, at tills and cash points, were they, were they going to be helpful or not going to be helpful? Um, you know, cloth masks, are they suitable? Are they actually as good as the trust that we put in them? Or should they really be surgical masks? Or actually, are they not good enough to trust? So, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, everyone's acting, you know, with the very best of intentions, and I don't seek to blame anyone. But what I'm worried about is we come out of this pandemic without really good, robust evidence to say, we know this works in this situation, and we know this doesn't work. And it is really difficult to do trials. There's no question about that when situations are fast moving, when things are really difficult, when people are really stressed, but the recovery trials that were done for, and the vaccination trials that have been done in, in the middle of a pandemic with thousands of people have been amazing, and incredible, fantastic. And one of the things I think they've proven is that you can do things in normal practice in a trial situation, get data really quickly, and then act on that data. And I would love to see the same kind of principles applied to non-drug interventions, which I know is difficult to do, and I'm not underestimating how hard it would be to do, but it would be fantastic if we could get better evidence that would really help us know what works and also what doesn't work 
work because when something doesn't work that's that's not a bad thing to know that's really useful to know because it then then means you shouldn't rely on that intervention that can't give you what can't, can't give you what you want so you move on and you try and think what the next best thing should be so i hear what professor yeah. what you're saying about wearing a mask on public transport i think actually i would be avoiding public transport for a bit longer i'll be on my bike of course rather than rather than an a tube but of course some people don't have that that choice to make so it, so it exactly. is really it, it, these are really well, hard me, choices and really hard decisions let me let me put that to to, to professor witty i mean there, there clearly is a a huge gap still between those people who are talking about next week as Freedom Day and those who are uh, nervous, very nervous, given the the numbers of infections that we're we're looking at. I mean, I you know I'm sure you agree about the the public the clarity of public messaging that we've been hearing from from Dr. McCartney. But I wonder what you would what what you would say to those people who are seeing this as well. We're done with it now. I think that uh, relatively few people are thinking that, to be honest, and I think I'll go back to my previous point. I think the great majority of people will take this quite steadily. Uh, the polling says that, and in fact, observation says that. Uh, and this is across the board. This isn't just in, you know, small groups. I think this is, this is quite widespread. Uh, and all the way through this, if you look at what people have been saying in academic studies, in polling studies, and in more, most importantly, in what they've been doing, They've often been ahead of government. They've been ahead of experts. They've simply behaved in an incredibly sensible and responsible way to protect their families and those around them. And I do actually expect that's likely to continue to happen. Legislation was really important uh, to begin with uh, because it actually meant that everybody had to do this. This is a kind of gradual move away from something where government insists. But I think what we'll be seeing is not a sudden change of behavior by most people, it will by some, uh, our, our, our next Monday in England is going to be slightly different timings in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But what we will actually see is a much more graded thing. And as people see the, move, the, the numbers going up as they are at the moment, I think people will be very cautious. And if they see, start to see the numbers coming down, they'll begin to experiment a bit more and take a few more uh, sort of steps out towards a more, a more normal experience to where, what it was before. But if you look at the studies of what's going on at the moment, most people at the moment, the average person in the UK, is having about half the number of social interactions they had uh, just before this pandemic began. Uh, and that is really reflecting the fact that they've heard the messages and they're behaving in a sensible and responsible way. Uh, Dr. Dr. Fong, uh, four days to go, all legal restrictions on social contact are going to be dropped in England. We are clearly seeing a rise in infections. Um, even in vaccinated people, so far not being translated in a spike in hospital admissions. When you look at the numbers now, how confident are you that that trend will continue? Or, or should we be concerned that at some point hospitals could become overwhelmed again? So it's difficult, isn't it? Um, I remember you know, being taught that every pandemic is like a fingerprint, they're unique in character. But I think what I've learned in my experience of COVID-19 is that every wave of this pandemic is like a fingerprint, unique in character. And so it's beholden upon us to monitor very closely the situation. Let's be clear, infections uh, numbers are rising and, and uh, hospital admission rate is rising, ICU occupancy is rising, albeit more slowly than it has in the past. Um, and the curse of this whole thing is that we have, you know, we have to be perpetually vigilant. We have to monitor the situation. We have to be prepared to change our minds if if the data change. We have to be prepared to act. And and it's difficult, that. It's difficult because we think, well, we've seen two, three waves already. Um, we know a little bit about this, but that's not how it works. The situation is so complicated that all we can do now is watch it like a hawk and be have the courage to act if we need to act and and that's what the leadership is that's what leadership is about in in this thing it's communicating those difficult counterintuitive ideas in a timely fashion when the data points in that direction that's what the science is uh, and that's what we have to rely upon Let, let's have a, a, a yes of course one of the problems that uh, we face have always faced in trying to uh, communicate this 
is that the way that um, epidemics work is they just go by exponential curves. And that's incredibly non-intuitive. People don't find that easy to understand. But they're either doubling or they're halving. And currently, this epidemic is doubling. And it's doubling in cases. It is also doubling in cases of people going to hospital. And it's doubling in deaths. Now, at the moment, the number of cases in hospital is mercifully much lower than it was previously, but not trivial. We've still got over 2,000 people in hospital, and that number is increasing. If we double from 2,000 to 4,000, 4,000 to 8,000, 8,000, and so on, uh, it doesn't take many doubling times till you're into very, very large numbers indeed. And the doubling time at the moment is probably around about three weeks. Could be a bit less than that, actually, for hospitalizations. So it doesn't take many doublings till we're in actually quite scary numbers again. And of course, for every individual hospital person in a hospital, this is potentially very dangerous, and there will be, there will be people who die or have lifelong effects from this. So I don't think we should underestimate the fact that we could get into trouble again surprisingly fast. And I think saying the numbers in hospital are low now, that does not mean the numbers will be low in hospital in five, six, seven, eight weeks' time. They could actually be really quite serious. And as Kevin says, at that point, if it looks as if things are not topping out, we do have to look again at, and see see what what's go, what where we think things are going. So it is very important that people don't imagine just because numbers are low now they will always stay low. Exponential curves to look as if they're going very slowly, and then suddenly they look as if they're going very fast, and that's just the maths of them. Yeah, incredibly sobering uh, reminder of that. Uh, let's have a question from uh, a member of the audience uh, from Marina. Uh, th this is kind of connected to COVID, but about other vaccines too. How is the experience of creating the COVID vaccine as quickly uh, as scientists have done be replicated elsewhere, for example, HIV or a malaria vaccine? Uh, one for you, Chris uh, Whitty, I think, and, and perhaps uh, Kevin uh, Fenton too. Uh, I mean, it's taken decades um, to, to even the research in, in HIV uh, vaccines has, has been going on for four decades, more than three decades at the very least? Well, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have a first go at it. I mean, the, we are fortunate that COVID is a disease for which we've been able to develop a vaccine. Uh, first thing to say about the development is, of course, it didn't come out of nowhere. The vaccine didn't suddenly start being worked on when COVID emerged in January work on vaccines in general, work on the different platforms, and indeed work on coronavirus vaccines has been going on for some years. And we, we've been, for example, looking at, you talked about uh, the MERS uh, um, outbreaks that have been, we've been working on MERS vaccines for, for several years now. And that one of those programmes, the one in Oxford, is what was then transferred over uh, to actually work on what became the AZ vaccine that we have at the moment. So this is not just sudden this is built on many many years and in terms of the principles actually hundreds of years of experience of how uh, vaccines work but there are also some infections for which uh, getting immune responses to them that actually stop the infections is incredibly difficult as you say we've never achieved it with HIV in a meaningful way Kevin's a real expert Kevin, Kevin sorry Kevin Fenton in this case is a real expert on this uh, and uh, doing one in malaria has always been just around the corner, but people have been trying to do that for a long time. Some very promising uh, signs at the moment, but let's see what happens when these get into big studies in, in uh, children in Africa, which is where we really need this, uh, and then get into proper operational practice. So some diseases, it has just proved a lot easier to develop than others, but we, I don't think we should just think this was very, very quick. It was the last mile was quick, but there are many miles of science that go behind that. Uh, that have got us to where we are at the moment. Kevin Fenton? That's right. I, I completely agree with you, Chris. And one of the things I've been reflecting on as I've been doing lectures and talks on the future of HIV and ending HIV transmission in the United Kingdom by 2030, the question is, what can we learn from our experience with the coronavirus vaccine development that can help us to, for this final mile with HIV? How do we learn about fast-tracking clinical trials, about engaging large numbers of the population in these trials and being able to engage communities in ways that ensure that you bring communities along as you're developing these technologies? 
how do we take full advantage of the new approaches to medicines regulation uh, to think about how we develop new approaches, new drugs safely and effectively using our clinical trials data. So lots that we're learning from the coronavirus vaccine experience that we'll be able to bring into or work with HIV, TB and malaria. And the converse is true because, you know, a lot of what we used in community engagement, in understanding effective messaging, in promoting and sustaining behavior change from HIV, we were able to think about its application for the coronavirus response. So we're learning all the time and sharing this learning with other infectious diseases, with other conditions. And I think that the foundation that we've built for this pandemic really puts us in a good stead for other infectious diseases moving forward. You, you all, um, all of you know uh, at first hand how extraordinary the response has been to this pandemic uh, in terms of uh, not just the scientists, but everyone who has encountered it. But there has also been a pretty considerable level of backlash, uh, not just against the government or governments around the world, but, but also against public health officials, not just because of the restrictions, but some of which we've alluded to, you know, the way in which people uh, are dealing with the virus, their scepticism about it and so on. I, I wonder, just very quickly and briefly, all of you, just give me a sense of whether you were taken aback by those kinds of reactions. Uh, let, let's start with you, Dr. Fong. I, I'm not, look, I, I actually understand the uh, unease and the anger that people might feel about what this pandemic has done to them. I mean, in, in a way, we're all sort of having this grief reaction about the life we had before the pandemic and the life we have now. Uh, and, and people have lost a lot. People have lost a lot. People who've been infected, lost relatives, lost their lives. People have lost livelihoods. Um, and, you know, I think we've talked a lot tonight about engagement. And this is really all about engagement, how we engage with one another, how we respect one another in all of this, how we make sense of all of our experience in this. But this is real. Um, I can't say it plainer than that. Um, and so I've not been taken aback so much by, by, by the backlash, but, but it, is, it is difficult. It makes our lives more difficult and it makes it more difficult for us to do what needs to be done. So I, I would say not surprised, but it is difficult to experience that. Dr. McCartney? Yeah, it, it's interesting. So I have to say, um, I, and I know probably um, Chris will not thank me for mentioning um, this, but when, when the incidents happened involving um, Professor Whitty, I felt just so sad and so upset, even though you um, conducted yourself with huge, I think with massive amounts of leadership and showing us all how to react um, to, to difficult situations um, when, when someone is, is face to face um, being being unpleasant and putting someone in a, in a very difficult situation. And um, it, it was awful to see for someone who's worked so incredibly hard and, um, you know, it, it was it was very distressing to see so god only knows what it been like um, for, for yourself but i suppose at the same time these situations are very rare and i suppose that's why we think about them so much they are different from a normal experience it wasn't so long ago people were clapping on their doorsteps um for for people working in the nhs and and, and i think people who have got um ill feeling towards the health profession or public health or government are a very disparate group of people who've got very different reasons for thinking and believing in the way that they do they they can't really be grouped together. Some of those people have got reasonable concerns, have got reasonable um, reasons for being upset or for, for being aggrieved. Some people have never been put in positions of trust themselves. They have um, you know, well-defined reasons as to why they might not trust authority for all kinds of reasons, as, as Kevin was saying. So um, I, not surprised, but sometimes just really, really sad. Chris Whitty. Um, I, I was uh, mainly taken aback by how amazingly people uh, were prepared to do really difficult things for really long periods of time, if I'm honest. Uh, if you look at any major public health campaign, there have always been people who've resisted it, including ones that you just think, how on earth could you do that? Uh, and some of that resistance has been, um, has been violent uh, in, in a way we're not talking about here, not school schoolyard stuff. I mean, uh, sadly, for example, in the polio eradication campaign, several people who are trying to stop children being paralyzed were killed 
if, you know, in, in the last few years. So the idea that there is always a very, very small minority of people, and it is always a very small minority of people, have very strong views is not particularly surprising. I think what is really remarkable is the fact that the great majority of people have taken a huge hit to their lives to protect others over a very long period of time. That's the thing, actually, that surprises me uh, in a very pleasant way. I feel very uplifted by that, actually. Uh, another question uh, from, uh, who's this person? Uh, John from the audience wants to know, what's the main lesson learned from handling uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? And ha has the experience over the past uh, 14 months made us better prepared for the next one. There are, of course, lots of people who are virus hunters and they are working on and looking at the next zoonotic uh, disease that might be coming our way. Um, Chris, let's start with you. Um, we're, we're better prepared for a pandemic like this one. The problem is that the next one is, will not be like this one. Uh, uh, and as Margaret rightly said, I think we haven't probably learned all the lessons even from this one that we should have done. I completely actually agree with the points she was making. But if you think about the last really serious pandemic, uh, that was HIV, completely different, sexually transmitted, some intravenous drug use, completely different routes, different scientific responses. The last really big outbreak in, in many ways that the UK intervened on, the huge outbreak in Ebola, of Ebola in West Africa, completely different drivers, a touch disease, totally different ways you responded to it. So I think the day, you know, we shouldn't assume that the lessons we got at the moment should be translated straight over. And in fact, arguably, some of the mistakes we made early on was we looked back to previous pandemics and thought, oh, it'll be like that. And it wasn't. And I think that's so what we really need to do is at each time, yes, learn the lessons. And as Margaret says, as best we can, systematize that learning uh, in a way that you can learn from, but accept that the next time will be different. Every time, the final thing I'd say is every time at the end of one of these pandemics, everyone says, we never again, we must not again disinvest from public health. And then several years later, every time they do. That lesson, I, I'm going to say now, I hope that lesson's been learnt. Let's see. Mm. Uh, an another question from the audience, Angela from Surrey. How are you planning to track that people still have antibodies from the vaccine going forward? And will those that have fewer antibodies be part of the booster programme? And there's another one that's kind of connected. Erin um, from Gloucestershire asks, will the booster jabs be adjusted to be more effective against new variants? Uh, one for you, Kevin Fenton, I think, and then and possibly Chris too. I think Chris may well be better placed to uh, talk about the, the serology and, and the effectiveness of the vaccine booster. But just to say, from an implementation perspective, we really work closely with the JCVI on uh, recommendations for vaccination. And then we work with our local authority partners and the NHS on implementing those recommendations. So whatever guidelines are out in the autumn for boosters, we're prepared and looking forward to working with our partners to implement it. But Chris, you may want to reflect on the serological monitoring as well. well I mean, there definitely is monitoring of the population as a whole to see how many people actually do have uh, antibodies. It's an astonishingly high number now in the UK. It's on, on, on blood uh, donor data, it's about 90% of the population because of the huge vaccination program that's happened. Uh, some people have lower rates. It's not really clear whether that translates into effects on the vaccine. And I think we do know who are the people who are most at risk of, of COVID. And it's age is the predominant thing. And then certain particular groups who've got particular medical conditions, much better data on that than we had at the beginning. And those are the people I think who are likely to be recommended, although it does, as Kevin says, depend on JCBI. And on variants, um, we don't yet have variant vaccines, but we definitely will do. And one of the ways in which I think uh, we will learn to live with this infection, as we do with many other infections, living with infections is what humans do. We've always done so. We always will. I, I think people make a bit of a thing of this. It's, 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 this is what medical science does. It's helped allow us to do that, uh, is to have vaccines, which if we project forward two or three years, I'm expecting vaccines that are probably against several different variants to be given at, at varying rates, depending on people's ages and how vulnerable they are, just as we do with some other, other vaccines. But uh, we don't yet have those. Hopefully we will have the beginnings of those next year and they will become only better, I think, as time goes by. 
We've got just a, a little time uh, to just get some final reflections from each of you. I was reading uh, a, a doctor in Pittsburgh who described the pandemic as the 21st century version of a world war. I wonder in that context, from each of you, 30 seconds, no more, uh, what you would say about what has happened over the last 16 to 18 months. Let's start with you, uh, Margaret McCartney. Well, that was kind. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I think that, um, well, young people, I think, have taken a huge hit over this. I think our young people deserve to be absolutely congratulated and thanked for the way that they have um, limited their activities and their um, and their joyful uh, ability to do things. You know, that they've restricted themselves so much in order to protect the older members of our population and, of course, have been last to be vaccinated and then last to have the freedoms that some vaccinated people might be. So I hope that um, older people um, are going to be very kind to them because they certainly deserve it. I think the pandemic has shown us how health inequalities play out. So the people who are already worse off have become even more worse off and because they've been at the highest risk through COVID, not just getting it, but also succumbing to it as well. I think it tells me how strong we need primary care and public health to be. These are the foundations of our NHS. Public health is really important. Primary care is really important. Some might say they're unglamorous and unsexy, but my God, if they're not working properly, you will know all about it. Thank you. Uh, Chris Whitty. I think um, this has been an extraordinary um, uh, expression of the fact that um, there were two things we needed to uh, deal with this virus, and it is still left with, with huge scars and more are coming, unfortunately, around the world. But the two things have been all of society acting together and the power of science. Either, either of those alone would not have been able to do this. Science would not have been able to do it in time, uh, and society is what was able to do that. Uh, but we really needed the scientific response to uh, get on top of this for the long term, to de-risk it and to bring it to a problem that we can manage uh, in, in the medium to long term. So, I mean, those two things together, and I, I, you know, we've not seen something on this scale, uh, certainly in this country, for uh, at least a generation, and it has been remarkable. Professor Fenton? I think this war has taught us uh, three things. First, I agree with Margaret on inequalities. I think no one emerging from this pandemic will not know what inequalities means and how it affects our neighbours, the people we work with, uh, people in other communities. And I think that new understanding and that new focus is one that we need to take from this experience. I think we have learned about the power of the community response. I think uh, starting the pandemic and thinking that the solutions are going to be biomedical, uh, we have proven throughout the course of the pandemic that the community response is equally important, especially as a tool to address inequalities and to ensure you have more sustainable responses. And then finally, I think everybody now understands the role of the chief medical officer and public health. And as uh, Chris has said, I think the legacy from this will be how we fund, how we value, how we invest in the public health infrastructure for a country in the months and years ahead. Last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Fong. Gosh, um, this wasn't war, but it was warlike. It's like nothing I have ever experienced in my life before. I hope never to experience anything like it ever again. Um, it taught me how little we were alone, how much we were capable of being together. Um, uh, it taught me just how incredible the health service that we have, the National Health Service that we have, how incredible that institution is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, I hope that people understand what was given uh, you know for this what 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 people gave so many people gave uh to 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 you know to fight this um and and, and the, i hope that we come out of this that and learning the lessons that should be learned which is you know this is about us looking after each other in society and not just those of us who work as healthcare professionals or in public health uh it's 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 about all of us looking after each other that's how you beat this everybody looks out for another everybody 
tries to protect everybody else. That is how you get out of a pandemic. And so I hope that we learn that above all things. What a wonderful note on which to end. And all of you have said uh, similar things throughout this evening. Uh, that's all we have time for now. Thank you so much to the most remarkable panel, Professor Kevin Fenton, Professor Chris Whitty, Dr. Kevin Fong and Dr. Margaret McCartney. Thank you for your time. And the incredible work that you have all done. And uh, thank you to all of you, wherever you're watching from. Uh, do stay safe, continue to stay safe. Thanks to all of you for being a part of this evening. If you found this evening's discussion interesting, informative, inspiring, there are many more events on the Science Museum's website, including the next in the Science Museum Group's Climate Talk series, a virtual panel discussion next month, which will explore how the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow in November can achieve success. Visit the link below to book a free ticket. And if you'd like to support the Science Museum Group's mission to inspire the next generation, you can also find a link to make a donation below. Thank you to everyone involved this evening. Have a very good night. <laughs>